Hey, and welcome back to Tell Samira. Today I'm talking about the narcissist and the scapegoat at a funeral. Somebody requested this, so I'm going to do my best to tackle this subject here. If you have not already subscribed, please go ahead and subscribe and hit that notification bell and stay around. If you like the content I'm bringing, please like this video. So the only thing I can talk about for a funeral is my own experience with my narcissistic mother. I can't talk. I mean, she's not dead. She's still alive, at least to my knowledge, because I'm no contact. But yeah, so I haven't gone to a funeral of somebody that I know who is a narcissist, but I can tell you the hell I experienced being the scapegoat child, being at a funeral with a narcissist. Now, I am not just going to put the blame on my mom. I'm going to tell the truth. I was very sensitive, even um, as a young adult and even as a child and uh, teenager, I was very sensitive to funerals. I didn't like when people died because unconsciously, I know it now, so it's conscious, but at the time it was unconscious. You know, I didn't like the life that I was living. And so of course I had a hard time with death because it was like, I, I knew that something was wrong and missing in my life and I didn't want to die living an unfulfilled life. So I would be the person at the funeral who would just be crying uh, so much more than everybody else. Now I was not the type of person who would think, oh my God, so-and-so is dead. Nothing like that. I wasn't screaming, ah, help me, help me. Nothing like that. I would just be there crying a river, just constantly crying. I was crying so much, the thing would even embarrass me. I would have tissues everywhere. I just couldn't stop. My eyes would be swollen, under eyes swollen. And so my mother being the narcissist, you know, she couldn't stand that. For instance, when her brother died, I was sitting right next to her and I kept crying. And then eventually I stopped and she was like, well, look over at me. Don't even start back up, you know? So she would just be offended. I noticed that, um, the relationship dynamic that anytime that she was upset, which was often, you know, just, um, seemed to hate life, no kind of joy. And so she would then take that out on me. So she was already upset. So this was a bad situation to really be around her. And, you know, I always found myself sitting right next to her. So she'd be like looking at me in the corner of her eyes. So my own, you know, just pissed off. Like, you know, you better not start this dang crying again. You know, um, even when her father died, the crazy craziest thing was I was sitting behind her and I know I was not sniffling loud, <laughs> nothing like that. I know I was just crying and she just knew that I was behind her. So again, being pissed off because it was like two people on the side of her, oh, consoling her and everything. She turns around to me and is like, what is she, something like, what is she crying for? Doing all that damn crying. You know, and somebody had to try to, um, you know, people around her would try to, I don't know if you call it placate her. Like a lot of people wouldn't call her out on her obvious crazy behavior. So they were just trying to like, oh, you know, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. But then she would turn around again and be like, give me this glare. You know, I'm not even making this. I can't even make this up. You know, there's this crazy kind of glare like this. Just, you better stop it. You better, you know, because she was mad. So it was like, who else could she find to kick and dump, you know, um, be a butthole to uh but me as the scapegoat so those are the kind of things that she liked to do so for me I would just try to make sure that I didn't you know didn't have to be around her at funerals because I eventually began to see like wow she's like really upset and then I you know she's getting really angry at me so this isn't going to be a you know a really good situation and I heard her telling somebody um at the funeral I think it may have been her father's funeral saying something like uh she would call me Sam usually, but if she was mad, it was Samira. But um, <laughs> other than I don't know why that's so funny, but it is. It's funny. But uh, other than that, it was. I know I heard her telling someone like, "Yeah, Sam, she just cries. You know, just cries too much and everything. You know, that's one of the reasons why I was happy." Um, my childhood best friend died maybe six years ago. And I know my mother went to the funeral. I didn't go because it um, when she died, you know, from here in LA to get back to uh, Gary, Indiana, where I'm originally from was about $700 
for a plane ticket, last minute plane ticket, and I didn't have it, so I didn't go, felt really bad. But my mother went, but I was happy that I didn't go because one, like I said, I was already sensitive about the funerals and crying. I haven't been to a funeral in a long time, thank God. But you know, I knew that I would, would have been an emotional wreck. And I am telling you, I do believe in honoring your parents, meaning for me, my honor is maybe different. It's just like not cursing the parents and not killing them in their sleep, even though you want to, not poisoning their food, that kind of stuff. So I just knew that if I had gone to that funeral and she had looked at me and said something, I was gonna throw all Anna out the window and it was not gonna be a pretty sight if she had said one word or one Samira or one look it would have just been total disaster and they would have had to clear that funeral home. You can think what you think, but I know me. So that was not going to be good. So that was my experience. Um, I will tell you this. I'm not sure if this person was a narcissist, but this person was very abu an abusive man uh, with a lot of narcissistic traits. I would say physically abusive to women uh, he knew and when he died you know there was still some people crying and I was crying but it wasn't so much about him it was about me not being able to deal with death and I remember um, his son-in-law yeah no not his son-in-law uh, his uh, stepson had um, didn't like him like hated him and actually came over I mean didn't even he came in late he looked like he had been painting houses you know I think he did it on purpose he just looked very raggedy and he never had, had ever looked like that in all the years I knew and he actually just walked in the door and went straight up to the casket looked turned around and walked right out it was like he was looking in to make sure he was dead and later that same person called me and was like heard me crying and was like why are you crying you knew what kind of person it is but at the time I didn't understand my own psychology and I didn't know it was a wasn't about the individual that died so that's the only thing I can remember that people do pretend to be nice at um, a narcissist funeral even if that person is a butthole you know, all of us got some buttholeish ways. But even if that person is evil, whatever it is, I've just found that people are still going to be nice um, and, and lie and tell these great stories at the funeral. You know, and I know someone else had um, confided in me that her um, narcissistic grandmother had died. And I didn't want to do a video about how to feel when a narcissist dies because I haven't had that feeling. I mean, I haven't had that personal experience, so I didn't really have anything to go on. But so only thing that what I would encourage if you have a narcissist that dies is just to try to um, not uh, make that person into something they weren't. Just be true to yourself. If, if it was some good memories, then you honor that good memory in, in whatever way you want to. Light a candle, uh, put some, you know, um, you know, I don't know. Whatever it is that you, only you know how to honor someone, truly. So, uh, yeah, you remember the good, but also remember the bad. Because the reason I say remember the bad, that keeps you in reality. If we start only remembering the good when a person dies, a narcissist or not, it sets us up for failure. Because it's like, oh, I should have, would have did this. I don't live my life as I should have, would have did this. It's like, if you are going to feel guilty because the narcissist died, then maybe you want to look at it. If you want to do limited contact instead of no contact, what do you want to do? so you can just live your life authentically without having any doubts like for instance I know some people will say probably say that to me I haven't heard it yet I don't think that hey what if your mom dies you're going to feel better I don't know how I'm going to feel because my mom is not dead I can only assume and right now how I assume is no I'm not going to feel dead because I I hope that I will remember what kind of person she was. I'm not going to glorify her. There were some good times. There were some good years, especially between one and five. So I would honor her for that, what she did. And even though she's a narcissist, she still made sure that I was clothed, uh, that I had shoes and whatever else, and that I had food. And there were a few times that she actually did come to my defense. You know, so I'm not going to pretend that she's just all horrible or that she's just all good. I'm going to say, bring it to the middle, bring that back and say who this person was so I think that's how you do do well is just being true to yourself you know I, I I don't feel and of course I don't know but I don't imagine that I'd be beating myself over the head oh I should have um, reached out to my mom or oh life is short we should have mended it no for me life is too short to deal with somebody who treats you like a butthole life is too short to deal with somebody who manipulates you who uses you who lies on you who calls you a bitch for no reason who calls you crazy to other people to try to actually stain your name 
within your family and your community. Life is just too short to be around somebody who's jealous of you, who hates you, who wants to destroy you, who rejoices when you do wrong, who throws up your wrongs in your face, somebody who laughs at you when you fail. Life is too short for any of that. So what I say is, hey, I try to live my life free. So, hey, I hope you got something out of this. I'd love to hear your comments. And before I go, I want to say, ta-da! I finally, Amazon finally sent me my author's copy of my book in the mail. It is, it is called, I Should Have Worn a Curtain, A Tale of Bulimia, Self-Loathing, and Romance. This is a sh very short story, as you will see. Very short story, right to the point, but very impactful. It talks about, uh, it's a fictional story about a woman named Shayna who's dealing with uh, body image troubles, meaning she has an eating disorder, uh, bulimia. She's also trying to be in love and just going totally crazy with the bulimia is out of control. Then she finds this man who may or may not be a narcissist. I don't want to spill the tea, but you can find this book on Amazon. Again, I am the author, Samira Alexander. No, this is not my story, meaning not a story about me. It is a work of fiction that deals with uh, self-esteem eating disorders and a bit of dating and romance and it can be found on Amazon and you can find the information down in the description section below. So please like, subscribe and share this video and give me your comments. Bye.